The following content is brought to you by Chilton Evangelical Church in Manchester, UK. Our location is M21 9FG. Our Sunday services are at 11 a.m. and 6:30 p.m. For more information, visit our website chiltonevangelical.org. Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. It's um, it's lovely to be with you. Um, I do hope you are well. And um, well, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Paul Morgan, and um, I work for Milnro Evangelical Church. So um, it's um, yeah, it's it's great to be here. Now, I want to start off by asking you a question. Question. Don't worry. You don't have to answer it. I'm not going to make you. But it's this. If you went and you planted some flower seeds in a pot of soil and you made sure that that pot of, um, um, with the soil made, sh- made sure that it had all the sunlight and all the water that it could possibly need. And would you find it strange if it didn't ever grow a flower? If you did everything you were supposed to do, you gave it all the sunlight and all the water it could possibly need, but nothing happened. Would you think that was strange? It would be strange, wouldn't it? It would show that there is some kind of a problem. Well, in a similar way, God has planted seeds in the heart of every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And... And because God has planted these spiritual seeds in the heart of every believer, he is, um, he's looking to see what, we'll, um, what we will do about that. You see, he has given us the responsibility of living in a way that will help to bring about spiritual growth in our lives. My hope with this message is that we'll be able to see if we're making the most of what God has given us or whether there is some kind of a problem and we need to change. So I've titled this message today, We Need to Grow. We Need to Grow. And there are three points, not long points really, that um, I want to make. Point one is divine gifts. That's verses three to four. Point two is developing the qualities of Christ. Developing the qualities of Christ. That's verses five to seven. And point three is definite benefits of the qualities. Definite benefits of the qualities, verses eight to 11. So firstly, point one, divine gifts, verses three to four. Now there is something I must make clear about these verses that we're looking at today. And that is that these verses are not for everyone. No, no. These verses that we are looking at today are for believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. In order for you to receive all the wonderful benefits that this passage speaks about, you must first place your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You must believe all that the Bible says about him, that Jesus is the Son of God, who came into the world to save sinners, and that he died on the cross, taking the punishment for sin and was raised from the dead. If you are willing to believe in the Lord Jesus and all the Bible says about him, and if you're willing to ask God to forgive you of your sins, then you will be forgiven and you will be brought into the family of God. You will be saved from an eternal hell and you will spend eternity in heaven. And you will receive, of course, all the wonderful benefits and blessings that this passage speaks about. Now then, if you are a Christian, when God brought you into his kingdom, when he granted you his salvation in Christ, he gave you something else. And we can see that in verse 3. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. God's divine power is an infinite power. And through his infinite power, he has given to us believers, not some, not most, but all things, all things. 
that we need for life and godliness. So God didn't say, here's half of what you need for life and godliness. No, no. He said, here's all that you need. Here's all that you need for life and godliness. God hasn't given us a Phillips screwdriver and said, I want you to build this wardrobe. And then you go and you look at the instructions and there are all these different types of screws, meaning you would need all these different types of screwdrivers. No, no, no. God has given us the toolbox. We are well-equipped, well-resourced, well-provided for. The Spirit has given us all the tools we need for us to grow into mature believers in Christ. We'll see later on, though, that although God has given us all the tools we need, we do still need to put in some effort, some hard work, and use the tools that we have been given in order to see the benefits of having them. So we're given all things, and this is, of course, through our knowledge of him. Where do we get this knowledge from? From newspapers? No. From fashion magazines? No, no. From TV guides? No, no. I'm sure you've already guessed that we get our knowledge from the Bible, from the word of God. The Bible gives us knowledge of God. It tells us of Jesus Christ, it tells us of his perfect sinless life, of his, um, of his taking the punishment for sin, of his sacrificial death. It tells us of his resurrection, his ascension, and his soon return. And this knowledge of Christ helps us to have a relationship with him. And it is through that relationship that we are given all things for life and godliness. You'll also notice that he has granted us these things. He's given it us. It was a gift. And I can tell you, it was a gift that we didn't earn. It was a gift that we didn't deserve, but it was a gift from him, from his grace. God's kindness and generosity doesn't stop there because he's not just given us everything we need for life and godliness, but he's also, verse 4, given us his precious and very great promises. The promises of God are so powerful that possessing them is enough to make us partakers of the divine nature. And as partakers of the divine nature, we have God's Holy Spirit living inside of us. And we, through the Spirit, partner with Christ in the work of God. It's clear then that we believe in Jesus are so not like the people of the world. The people of the world don't have the spirit of God living in them. No, no, this people of the world um, follow their own corrupt desires. That's at the end of verse 4. Believers in Christ, though, have escaped the power of sin, the dominion of sin, and the corruption of the world. That means then that believers in Christ are free and have a whole new nature and a whole new power available in them to live in a way that is different from the world. Now, if we look at verses three and four, we can see so easily that God is a God of great generosity. I mean, hear this. He gives us all things for life and godliness. He gives us his precious and very great promises. He has made us to partake in the divine nature and he has caused us to escape the corruption in the world. But we'll see, though, although God has given us a lot, and it's very clear, we do still need to make the most of what he has given us in order to see the benefits of what he has given us. And in order that we may grow spiritually and develop Christ-like qualities. Now, to give a bit of application at this point, I would say that you and I be very wise to keep in our hearts and in our minds this wonderful truth that we have a divine nature, a divine power living inside of us. We have the almighty God of heaven and earth. And so we should take from that all the motivation and all the encouragement that we can, that we have a divine nature living inside of us. And also, we should be encouraged 
and, and, and hold on to another great truth, that we have the knowledge of God, the knowledge of God readily available to us in the Bible. God's wonderful, wonderful promises. Friends, like, let's recognize what we have here and take from it as much as we can. If, if you're allowed to go into a vault filled with cash and filled with gold bullion, and you have permission to go in and take out as much as you want, and you go in and you walk out, with a pound coin, whose fault is that? God has opened for us the vaults of heaven, friends. Let's not take so little when he has given so much. Point two, developing the qualities of Christ, verses five to seven. In verses five to seven, we can see a list of qualities that we are told to add to our faith. Let's have a look at each of these words and see what they mean. The first quality is virtue or goodness. Being morally good. We are people who should be good and should do good in the power of Christ. We're to live and work in as close a way as possible to how Christ would if he was here on the earth in our place. And you know what, friends, it really is his goodness in us and it manifests out of us as we live in a way that is right in God's sight. The second quality is knowledge, clearly not knowledge of things like science and technology and other kinds of worldly knowledge. No, no, this is spiritual knowledge. This is knowledge of the things of God. This is knowledge which comes through reading the Bible or some other resource that helps us to understand the Bible better, like a commentary or a Christian book. The third quality is self-control. Self-control meaning we're not to give ourselves over to things. We're not to let pleasures control us. It means we have to restrain ourselves saying no to things that aren't good for us. God wants us to exercise self-control when tempted to sin. The fourth quality is steadfastness, which means we have to learn to be people who are resolute, determined, and unwavering. If you need an example, let me just say, we have to learn to be people who don't give up and who... Um, and it means also a continued effort despite difficulty. If you need an example, look no further than our Lord himself, the Lord Jesus, who set his face like flint to Jerusalem. He knew what awaited him was, would be, you know, terrible things, would be arrest, torture, you know, um, the wrath of God coming upon him, death it's, as well. But there was no backing out for the Lord Jesus such was his determination to finish the mission. And friends, we need perseverance. We need steadfastness so that we can deal with suffering better and not grumble and complain when trouble comes our way. The fifth quality is godliness. Now, this is not mere human. This is not mere human goodness. Some people do very nice things for each other, don't they? You may get people who do shopping for their neighbour or feed the cat for them while they're on holiday or cut their hedge or something like that. But no, no, godliness is something that covers everyday conduct. Godliness is a reverence for God and, is, and a desire to please him. And the sixth quality is brotherly affection. Being kind and caring to one another. Loving other believers. Let me ask you, do you love other believers? Are you holding anything against anyone in the church? Friends, if you are, I would urge you quickly to let that go. God wants us to show affection to one another. He wants us to care for each other. And finally, uh, the seventh quality is love. This is the love the Good Samaritan showed. It's a serving love. It's a selfless love. It's a sacrificial love. It's a love um, that's not been earned. 
It's the same love our Lord Jesus showed when he went to the cross for us. And it's the same love he expects us to show to people, whether they are believers or unbelievers. What is written here is not a set of rules to try harder, but we do need to put in effort. Because Peter says in verse five, make every effort to add to your faith. Then he lists these qualities. So we do need to put in effort. We do need to put effort into our relationship with God, effort in our praying, effort in our Bible reading, effort in our serving, and effort in our evangelism. And when we make an effort to develop our faith, God will honor our efforts and he will release his power and cause us to grow spiritually. God will honor our efforts and release his power and cause us to grow. And so we should look to him to enable us and energize us uh, by the power of the spirit. We need knowledge of his word, knowledge of his will, filling our hearts and minds. And as we learn more about Christ, and as we take into our hearts these great truths of the gospel and live them out, God will bless us and we will become more like Jesus our Lord. And we will see his qualities in greater measure in our lives. But hear this, friends, if we believe in God, just sit back. And take the Christian life easy and don't put in effort. It'll be like he's given us nothing when we know that he has given us everything for life and godliness. And so we mustn't take, we mustn't be casual in the Christian life. We must put in effort and we must look to God to enable us and energize us. And when we do, we will see growth. What we will see is we will see fruit from the spiritual seeds that he has planted in us. Great. Okay, so point three now. Definite benefits of the qualities, verses 8 to 11. Verse 8 says, <laughs> For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. There have been times in the past when I've read this and thought, I'm okay, I've got knowledge, I've got self-control, I've got love. I've been able to sort of tick the box by each of them, as it were. But it's not about that. It's not about just having the qualities, no, no. It's about growing in them. The verse says, if these qualities are yours and are increasing, it's only when we're growing in these qualities that we will be kept from being ineffective and unfruitful in our knowledge of the Lord. If we're not growing in the qualities, there is a problem. Imagine this. Imagine you had a child who grew normally until about the age of five. But then at the age of five stayed at the exact same height while reaching the age of six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. It wouldn't be too hard for you to see, would it, friends, that there is a problem here. And so we, we should examine our lives and see if we are growing in the qualities of Christ because we need to grow. Um, we do need to grow. Verse 9, for whoever lacks these qualities, he's so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. We can see with this verse that there is potential for a serious problem. It is possible to be a believer and yet live in a way where you have virtually lost all your spiritual sight which is crazy, which is crazy. If a believer lives having lost, virtually lost all their spiritual sight, it will mean being unfruitful. It will mean living almost exactly the same 
as a person who doesn't even believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The, um, the great hymn, Amazing Grace, it wouldn't make any sense at all if the lyrics were, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Oh, wait, I'm blind. Wouldn't make any sense, wouldn't it? No. So we must. And so, um, so then, how does a believer guard themselves from being unfruitful? This is important. How does a believer guard themselves from being unfruitful? It's this. We must remember. We must remember the cross. We must we must not make the mistake verse 9 says we can make, forgetting that we've been cleansed from our past sins. No, no. We must remember the cross. We need to remember um, the cross. The cross is our motivation. If we are not growing in the qualities of Christ, it's because we have forgotten the cross. We need to remember what Jesus did. We need to remember his love for us. We need to remember all he went through. We need to remember he has given us new life. We need to remember he saved us from hell. We need to remember he's got a place in heaven for us. We need to remember the works of the Lord through the cross. Verse 10. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. One of the greatest gifts a believer can have is assurance. Assurance. Knowing with absolute certainty that you will make it to heaven. When it is not just a doctrine in your mind, but a deep, deep conviction in your heart. Oh yes, I am going to heaven. What this verse is saying is, if we are diligent workers... God will give us assurance of our salvation. It may be helpful to give you some examples of a diligent worker. A diligent worker is like an office worker who stays up late to get their work done by the deadline. And a diligent worker is like a painter who carefully paints every strand of hair. And so, if we put effort energy and care into our relationship with God, God in his grace will grant us assurance of our salvation. That great gift of assurance. Verse 11. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is a verse that really should motivate us to put effort into our faith. We should be motivated to live the life of faith that the Apostle Peter tells us. Why? Because of what is in store for us believers in the future. What believers in Christ have waiting for them is way better than a golden ticket to Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. It's way better than winning millions on the national lottery. What believers in Christ have waiting for them is a place in eternal glory, eternal glory. A heavenly home where the joy never fades, where the peace never passes and where the love never ever ceases. So friends, let's remember that God, in closing, let's remember that God has given us all things for life and godliness. But we need to put effort, we need to put in effort as we live out our Christian lives. Let's remember that growing in the qualities of Christ helps us to live fruitful and effective lives. While not growing in them, will mean that we are ineffective and unfruitful. Also, let's remember 
that we have his divine nature inside us and his divine word with us. And finally, let's remember what Christ has done for us and what is in store for us in the future. Let's pray, friends. Let's pray.